night. I'm glad that you have decided to assemble with us, those who are here and those who are online as well. Also want to make note that I see uh, Brother uh, David and Sister Nicole and Colby here with us, and this is first time many of us have seen them in a long while, and um, uh, I'm glad for uh, the ability to come in the flesh and be in together with, uh, with the saints, and it's always a good thing. As the soldiers of the army of Israel cowered behind the rocks and in their tents, a young shepherd boy is called to answer the call of battle. One barking threat from an oversized Philistine was enough to stir this young man into action. He had the courage of a king, and courage that the king should have had but lacked. Same with any other man that would or should have come and stepped up to the fight. But the king could spare something. He could spare his armor. And so he gave it to the young man, thinking that he might use it. But as the young man walked around and tested that armor, it was not for him. And so he exchanged it for a sling and for a staff. While protecting his own father's sheep, he used these weapons against the lion and against the bear. And this Philistine would be no different. But as a young man untrained in the ways of battle and a giant man who was trained in battle uh, all the way from a youth, it seemed like there was no hope. But as David knelt down to select five smooth stones to put in his sack, he knew there was no doubt in his mind that the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob would be with him. And as the Philistine ran towards David, and glittering in his armor and his massive weapons that he brought to battle, he was incensed at this young man who uh, came at him. And this was the best that Israel could muster against the mighty Goliath. But David took that stone and put it in the sling. And as we sung with our children here tonight, that sling went round and round and round and round. And right at the right time, David released that. And he let that stone fly, and it went straight and hit its mark right in the forehead of that giant Goliath. And it says that giant came tumbling down. It's inspiring to read stories and accounts like David in our Bible, and it moves us. One might think of our Christian faith in terms of uh, military terms. Any good army and any good army is going to be well-disciplined in drilling. That way, when the heat of the battle comes and bullets may be flying, he is trained to do exactly what he is taught, even in the most stressful of circumstances. One operating procedure for uh, troops in an army is to fire their weapon properly. You might be thinking about it in a, a certain three stages. They have to make ready. In the second place, they have to take proper aim. And in the third place, they need to let it fly and fire. And while we are not engaged in physical warfare, we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But the spiritual battle that we are engaged in is one worth constituting ourselves in the proper way. It is one in which we are to be spiritually aiming in the right direction. And it is one in which we need to pick a specific target. And then we need to fire when ready. Tonight, I want to look at uh, these three stages, red, making ready, taking aim, and firing and want to see how the New Testament shows us that we as good soldiers can do our duty as soldiers of the kingdom. And I also want to, as we go through our lesson tonight, think of ways in which sometimes we have failures to either take the proper aim or making ourselves ready or maybe why we misfire, and also then giving encouragement and exhortation to do our duty as soldiers of the kingdom. 
Let's look at our first place this evening at Making Ready. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul talks to Timothy and he uses military terms to speak to him. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and starting in verse number 3, he says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He says, No one entangled in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has enlisted him as a soldier. In the first place, we need to make ready. We need to make sure that we enlist into the army of God. We, as enlisted soldiers, are volunteers. There are some people who get involved in different things of war, and they see it as just some adventure. Many people, before the uh, advent of World War I, went off to battle thinking that this was going to be some grand, fun adventure. They didn't realize the commitment that they had made. And oftentimes, many people do not think about the long-term commitment to the decisions in which we make. But when we decide to enlist in God's army, it is a lifelong duty in which we are to engage in, and we must enlist as a soldier. And just as an aside, tonight at the end of our lesson, we will extend the invitation for anyone who has yet to become a soldier in God's kingdom. And the second thing, as we make ready, we need to find the captain. We need to find the captain of our faith. Notice in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 10, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 10, your Bible will say that Jesus is the captain of our salvation. Some of your Bible translations might say that he is the pioneer of our salvation. He is the trailblazer, the one who is leading the battle from the front. And in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, it talks about Jesus being the author and the finisher of our faith. Well, that word author sometimes is translated as captain or sometimes, again, as pioneer. It is the exact same word that we saw in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 10. Jesus is our captain. And it is he who we must report to. He gives the marching orders for the troops. He tells us where we are to go and how we are to position ourselves. And so if we want to make ready, we not only need to enlist, but we need to make sure that we Report to the captain. The next thing we need to do is we need to make sure our minds are put in the right place. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verse number 1, it says, Let us lay aside every weight in sin that so easily ensnares us. There are things in this life that burden us, that drag us down, that keep us from putting ourselves in the right place at the right time. We need to get rid of those things and shed the things that, don't, that aren't necessary. There's some times where people go into a battle situation and they think they need everything that they might need. <laughs> they start to consider the ammunition that they need. They might consider the water that they need. They might consider what weapons or knives or grenades or something like that in the modern warfare. But all those things are things that weigh us down. We need to take stock and take proper uh, uh, consideration of what uh, tools that we might need for the battlefield. After all, Ephesians, uh, Paul talks about the armor that we are to be putting on. But we need to make sure that it is, is just enough for what we need. We don't need the extra things that weigh us down. Imagine a soldier who is trying to put his weapon up to his eyes and there is weight that is holding him down, and it's hard to stay level when he is looking down at that sight. It becomes harder and harder to be in the right place at the right time. We have to get our minds right. We have to take on the mindset of a servant. Notice, uh, go in your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 17. Notice verses uh, 7 through 10. Luke chapter 17, and look at verses 7 through 10. Jesus says, our captain, we as uh, our, our duty of servants, 
Verse number seven says, And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he, is, uh, he has come in from the field, Come in at once and sit down and eat. But will not rather to him say, Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk. And afterwards, when you, when, uh, afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he uh, did these things as he is commanded? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what is our duty to do. It's not a whole lot of praise that can be uh, seen sometimes on the battlefield, but it is duty. And that sense of duty, knowing again who the captain is and who the one is that is giving the orders and the grunts sometimes, as you're going to call them, or the private, he is doing his duty. And those things might be difficult. There might be extra tasks that the uh, enlisted soldier has that the senior officer doesn't have to do. But he still does his duty, and he does it in a way in which he is not thinking of himself any higher than what he ought to. There's ego that has to be shed in order for us to put ourselves into uh, the right place to uh, and be able to do our duty in the right way. Next thing we need to think about is we need to be sober-minded. Turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 8 talks about elders and their duty. As elders, they need to be, uh, verse number 8, and they need to be hospitable, a lover of what is good. They need to be sober-minded. In Titus chapter 2 and verse number 2, talking to old men on this place, he says, Old men, be sober and reverent and temperate, sound in faith and in love and in patience. But then he also talks to the young men in Titus 2 and verse number 6. He says, Young men, be sober-minded. And then again, one more time in Titus chapter 2 and verse number 12, he says, Teaching us uh, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly. Uh, you get the context of Titus. Titus is on Crete, a very worldly place. And they needed to find these men, both young and old, leaders and not, that they needed to be sober. How dangerous is it for someone to be waving around a uh, gun or something like that, and they are intoxicated? The same with us when we think about uh, our duty as Christian soldiers. We need to be sober-minded. We need to get our minds in the right place. There are reasons why sometimes people fail to make ready. I think about in Matthew chapter 12, in verse number 25, Jesus says, A house divided against itself cannot stand. Someone who is a soldier that has split allegiances is no good as a soldier. and He may not make himself ready when the time calls for him. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will love the one and hate the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Imagine uh, serving alongside someone who has uh, not figured out where his loyalties lie. It would be very dangerous. You, need, you are depending on that person to come along with you in the fight. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, as we have read already, verse number 4, talks about entangling our lives in affairs of this life. If the man has signed up for battle, he has to go and he has to leave the things behind. Again, we need to think about those things that ensnare us and weigh us down. Because those things are only going to uh, uh, make our minds not in the right place. I was listening to a podcast in which a, a former soldier talked about um, his wife and the things that his wife had to go through when he was gone and uh, away. And he said, I had to tell her my number one thing was the mission. How hard of a thing to uh, be in a relationship where your husband says to you, there is something else that's more important. But he says, if I do not focus on that mission, I don't get to come home. So there are priorities that we have to make with our loved ones sometimes. But sometimes because we have split allegiances, we can fail to make ready. Sometimes some people will make an excuse. 
Sometimes someone who is older will say, I am too old for service. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, excuse me, Romans chapter 4. Notice someone who is called at an old age. How old was Abraham when God called him? Seventy plus years. Look in Romans chapter 4, starting in verse number 18. Talking about Abraham, he says, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised. And so he was able to perform. Abraham has Isaac in his old age. And Abraham still counted on God to be faithful to what he had promised. And so Abraham, as the faithful servant, continued to put himself in the right place. And that son of promise comes along. Someone might say an an excuse and say, I don't have to be ready because I'm too young. What does Tim, uh, Paul tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15? He says, from a, childhood, from a child you have known the scriptures that is able to make you wise unto salvation, which is in Jesus Christ. We need to be teaching our children the scriptures from a young age because that is what is going to make them ready when the day comes when they need to be obedient in that faith. He tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 12, do not, be, do not let anybody be despised uh, of your youth, but you be an example. You be an example in word and conduct and love and spirit and faith and, and, and purity. There was no excuse, whether you're too old or whether you're too young. We need to make ready. Matthew chapter 22 Jesus tells a parable. Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14, tells of a wedding feast that a king throws for his son. And they slaughter the animals, and they make ready, and they send out invitations to people. But it says they make light of it. They didn't make ready. So he said, the guests are not worthy. Not only is destruction from the king coming towards them, but he said, go out to the highways and the byways. Invite the other people that we can fill up the the, uh, the wedding banquet. And everyone comes, and they're given a wedding garment to wear, but there's one that's found that's not ready. He didn't put on his garment for some reason. Wrath and, uh, that God has on him as well for someone who is not ready. So we, therefore, need to make sure that we have positioned ourselves in the right place. I'm not talking about in this physical world, but I'm talking about the spiritual battle in which we are uh, engaged in. We need to make ready. In the second place, tonight I want to think about taking proper aim. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 9, it says that we make it our aim, whether present or absent, we will be pleasing to him. Our aim is to be pleasing to God. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is talking about the aim and the direction in which our eyeballs are pointing. You know, we got white in our eyes. That helps us to see which direction we're looking. I could be facing this way, but I could be looking with my eyes over here. By seeing the whites in my eyes, You can see where I'm pointed, what is most important to me. And I need to make sure that I'm positioned in the right way, but I am also looking down the sights in the right way as well. In Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Sometimes when people are shooting uh, at a target, the target is far off. And so what happens to that bullet after a long while is that bullet will start to taper off and fall down. And so they have to look and aim just a little bit higher if they're going to hit the target in the right place. 
There are lots of uh, philosophies and uh, things that mankind can uh, come up with. But those things will fall short of the high aim in which we are to live in as Christ is. Christ is elevated to that place of power, the right hand of God. And guess where we are placed as well? At that right hand with him. We are to reign with Christ. So we need to make sure that our eyes, even though we are on this side of heaven, is still an upward gaze. And that we are aiming at something that is higher but oftentimes, we fail to take proper aim. Sometimes we fail to take proper aim because we fail to select a target. You might think, this is the wrong, don't we always aim at something? Think about, for example, uh, the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter tw- uh, 3, verses 14 through 16. What does God say about this Laodicean church? He says, you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor you're cold. And so I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. There's one foot in and one foot out. What happens when we take our aim and we aim at a very broad target? Or maybe we make our goals and aims so vague, it's hard to figure out where I'm at. And if I aim so vague, well, maybe I shot towards my target, maybe I didn't. But you'll never know because I did not take proper, precise aim. One of the biggest things I I was able to learn in school when uh, I had sermon prep and delivery, when Bob Bauer taught us, he said, make sure when you uh, are preaching, make sure you take the sniper rifle. The sniper rifle has got one target, and it's got to be laser-focused. He said, don't take the buckshot, because that scatters everywhere. we got to make sure our aim is small and tiny, and so that way we can aim and, and hit our mark, because we are aiming at the right things. Sometimes people fail to uh, take proper aim because they try to focus on too many targets. Think about Mary and Martha. When Jesus comes to her to their house, Martha is uh, cleaning and doing all kinds of extra prep and work. And what is Mary doing? She's sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him. Martha comes out and she's ready to chide the Son of God for telling her Mary needs to be in here working and like I am. And Jesus says she's picked a better target. Sometimes there are targets that are easy to hit. Uh, I think about that sometimes when I preach or have Bible class lessons, and I might aim for very shallow or low targets, and they can be easily hit. But if I keep digging, if I keep searching, if I I keep asking, I keep knocking, I, I keep going further, and I get something down deeper, I can hit some bedrock. And I can hit some truth that, hey, I'm going to hit these other targets anyways, and you can make the application as you go along. But if you go down deep enough and you hit down far enough, you can't get anybody to disagree with you. This is something I think we do. I'm looking first at myself. But I think about the political world in which we live in. And we aim so small and shallow and short. And like I said, I'm person number one. And there are easy things to make because there are a lot of politicians and people that are, don't do the right thing. But we look at the world and we see it through our Christian eyes or our Christian lens. And we see these are easy, low-hanging fruits, and I'm going to go right at it. But you know what happens? Because we are divided in the world in which we live in, when you start making fun of this one, then this one, we go back and forth and we get mad at each other and it causes divisions. But what if we go a little bit deeper, a little bit down lower, and we hit something more solid and we aim at something uh, that's better? Those other targets will get hit. (laughs) But we're aiming at something better. We're aiming at something higher. 
And like I said, I, this is something we need to have better aim at. When we're talking about our conversation, when we think about things, don't think about things in a political way. But notice something that is spiritually much deeper. And I think we'll, we'll be better for that. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus says in Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46, he talks about the merchant, the merchant who is searching for that pearl of great price. He says he's searched everywhere, and he's looking for the one. He's got a small laser-like focus on what he's aiming for. Once he finds that, he sheds everything else that is unnecessary, and he goes and buys it. And that's what we need to be aiming for when we think about how we are to position ourselves and when we look down the sights as we are getting ready to fire. The last thing I want to see tonight is once we make ready, once we take aim, then we got to fire. Turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, let's look at verses 22 through 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Not do hearers only, but doers of the word. This is not an academic uh, uh, endeavor. We're not talking about things in just theory. We need to be talking about uh, a, this is a means to an end. We study this to gain truth. But then we need to take it out and to act it out in our world. We need to fire. We need to release the string and let it fly. Romans chapter 2 and verse number 13, it talks about the hearers, not hearers of the word, uh, but the doers of the word were justified under the law of Moses. Sometimes, maybe more a lot of times, I think about my own life and I may have positioned myself in the right place. I'm properly aimed, but I fail to fire. Why do we fail to fire? Maybe it's we fail to follow through. Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 21, Verses 28 through 31, there was a man who had two sons, and he asked his two sons to go and work in the vineyard. The first one came to the father, and he says, I'll go. He had good intentions, didn't he? But then when it came down to time to fire, he didn't do it. I don't know if he was lazy. I don't know if he forgot. But for whatever reason, he didn't go. But then there was one who said, no, I'm not going to do it. But then he thought about it, and he thought about his position, and he thought about the aim in which he maybe was going in his life, and he said, I need to do what's right. And he went and worked in the field. And that son was justified. Sometimes people fail and fail to fire because we have fear of failure. This is an all right fear. We're going to fail often. Oftentimes, when the shooter looks down the range and aims at his mark, oftentimes, it's going to miss. That target is a very small thing. Sometimes there's wind. Sometimes there is things that he didn't account for. He still shoots anyway. First John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, it talks about if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Even though when we fire, we are still aiming and firing in the right direction, the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse us. Now, we don't say that you've hit the mark 100% of the time. But don't let that be something that holds you back from firing. There's a game at uh, carnivals. Uh, we just went to the Strawberry Festival this last week. Maybe some of you went. 
and they give you a little BB gun. And at the end of the line is uh, a card that's got a star on it. What's the aim? What, what are you, what's the goal of it? You try to shoot out that star. And it's hard to put that many bullets in the right direction and aim. And there's not many people that win. But do you do go up and pay the money and just hold the gun for a little while? No. We keep firing. Maybe we give them more money. We keep firing because we, now we got pride involved. And that's the way in which we need to orient ourselves in firing. Some people will fail to fire because of procrastination. I want to look in one last place in James. Go to James chapter 4. Look at James 4 verses 14 through 17 with me. Someone who says, maybe I can fire tomorrow or maybe the next week or sometime later on. You do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Well, preacher, what if I don't know enough? I'm not sure exactly the position I'm in. Preacher, what if I'm not sure if the scope that I have on my weapon is in the right way? I'll just sit this one out. I'll just wait till tomorrow. And maybe I can fire then. Are we promised tomorrow? We're not. And I go back to uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 and verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We need to seek that while it is today. And sufficient are the day of the troubles therein. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But what is the thing that I am lined up for and aimed at? And what is it that I need to be doing right now that I'm not doing? Someone in the world might just say, hey, aim away from hell. Well, that, that's good enough. Hell's over here. Let's just aim somewhere out here. That's how a lot of people will live their life. And that's better than aiming at hell. How about we aim at something a little bit higher? How about we fire at a target? And then once we see where that bullet hits on the target, let's reassess and let's go again. Once we see where that one lies, we make the adjustments, we take our stance, we make ready, we take aim, and we fire again. Oh, I missed this time. Let's do it again. I messed up again. Let's do it again. Let's keep going at it. Maybe that's off here, but maybe it's a little bit better. Maybe it's a little bit better. Maybe it's a little bit better. And each and every day, we have opportunities to fire as God gives us life in our lungs. And I think that constitutes a pretty good soldier. We're not going to get it perfect. We're not always going to be in the right position. We're not always going to have the sights exactly where we want it to be. But God tells us to keep firing. Don't say you're too young. Don't say you're too old. Just see what the next target is. And let's go for it. This quarter of study in our Bible classes, we're going to be talking about men and women of the Old Testament. And I'm excited for it. Some of my favorite characters are from the Old Testament. People like David. People like David who had courage to go and run and face those giant things that were in front of him. And it gives me courage. And I want to be like David. Positioned in the right place. Aimed at the right target. And letting those stones fly. Tonight, if you are someone who has not obeyed the gospel, if you're not enlisted, but we call on anyone who is ready and willing to take up that great adventure, to give your life to Christ. I'm not saying that it will be an easy life. I'm saying that it will be the very best life that you can have. 
Tonight, many of you who are enlisted, maybe you're thinking about the places that you are in your life. Maybe you say, preacher, for a long time, I haven't been very ready. I've been letting other people be ready for me. I've been putting off the things in which I need to do, and I've just been polishing my weapon. The invitation is also for anyone who needs help, needs strength, needs to be revitalized and re-encouraged to take up the fight as a good soldier, to get back into the fray, just like people like David did so long ago. Tonight, if you stand in need of the invitation, it is extended. The song has been selected. Please come forward as we stand and as we sing.